Well, good evening, and we trust that you'll have a happy new year. I'm going to be giving a devotional in English, same one that I'm giving in Spanish in another video here. And this will be a little shorter, but I trust that it'll be a blessing. And perhaps those who want to learn the Bible in Spanish could listen first to this in English and understand what we're saying. And then you'll be able to join with us in our praise to the Lord and understanding the Bible. We encourage you to learn another language like Spanish. Maybe if you hear a little in English and then you hear the sermon in Spanish, you'll understand it even better and learn a little Spanish to serve the Lord. So let's pray and then we'll sing and learn some of the Bible. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege we have of being able to serve you. Help us to glorify you and bless your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you like to sing with me a song? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, lost in his, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. December 30th, 1883, I believe, or no, 1835, 185 years ago, I've got a book here on Baptist history that tells the story of Zacharias Morell. Zacharias Morell, if you prefer to say it that way. We're going to be looking tonight at a Zachariah in the Bible, John the Baptist's father. But Zachariah Morell was born in South Carolina in 1803. He grew to come to know the Lord as a young man and when he was about 18 or so years old, even before then, he was already preaching. But especially by the time he was about 20 years old, he dedicated 14 years of his life to preach the gospel every single day through South Carolina, Tennessee, and the South. He preached so much that he got so sick he couldn't even talk. And so a doctor told him, you've got to go somewhere farther south than South Carolina where you could have a different atmosphere, rest your voice, and continue to serve the Lord. Well, Zechariah went then to Mississippi with his family, his wife and four children. By After he had been preaching for the 14 years, during that time he got married and had four children. But he heard about a place called Texas. He heard there was a lot of Indians there and a lot of Catholicism that he felt would make where he couldn't preach easily. And he heard that there would be a civil war, so he wasn't sure that he would go there. However, he continued preaching for a year or so and would take tours, travel, preaching. One time he returned from a tour, he found his doctor in his house with a couple of deacons and with... Um, others who were traveling to lawyers, I believe they said, and they were on their way to Texas. And he said, you know, I wanted to go to Texas. I wasn't sure if it was a good place. So let me go with you. He went with them. And as I said, that was 1835. And on December 30th, 1835, he preached his first sermon in Texas. He went and brought his family there gathered together a group of believers in about a year and a half. He had about eight people that established the first missionary Baptist church there. At that time, there was maybe 50 Baptist uh, believers throughout the whole state of Texas, but he had that small congregation to begin, and then he went and preached valiantly. They say he was rather crude, but very valiant, one day some Indians came and killed a couple of his parishioners and he went chasing after the Indians, but then returned 
to be able to protect his congregation and his family and continued preaching until God used him greatly, as we'll remember at the very end of this Bible study. But for right now, I'd like you to look at Zechariah, not Zechariah Morel, but Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 1. Here we have a hymn, a prayer, which is in the form of a hymn, that's called the Benedictus. The Benedictus says, Blessed be the Lord, because of the first word that comes out of his mouth in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God. You remember the story of Zechariah, how he didn't have faith that God would give him a son. He had prayed like Abraham had for many, many years, 20 perhaps, 25 years. I don't know exactly how old he was, but he was older than a man is to have a child usually. And his wife was older than a wife usually is to have a child. And so he, when the, an angel appeared in the temple when he was serving as a priest, and he didn't believe the angel. And the angel said, since you didn't believe me, you're going to be uh, mute. <laughs> you're going to not be able to speak. You're going to be dumb, was the word they might use, where you couldn't speak at all. And so he was quiet. He's had to leave basically his services in the temple, but God allowed him to have a baby nine months later, and then when the baby was born, they said, what's the baby's name? And Elizabeth said, his name's going to be John. And they said, but there's no one in your family named John. Wonderful name. It means the mercy, grace, love of God. From the Old Testament, John Nathan, Nathan means the gift, John, uh, love. So it's a gift of love, wonderful name of love or grace. However, we find here that there was no one in their family with that name and they thought it strange, the people. And they asked him, said, look, you can't talk, but can you give us some sign what his name should be? And he wrote on a tablet, verse 63, Luke 1, 63, he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. And they marveled all, and his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God, and fear came on all them that dwelt about them, and all the sayings were noised about throughout the whole country of Judea, and all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was upon him." Notice that unbelief makes us unable to praise the Lord. Many people don't come to church and sing and praise because honestly, they don't think it serves anything. They don't believe God has done great things for them or they would be praising the Lord greatly with their mouths and wanting to speak of the Lord. It's hard to get folks sometimes to witness and talk to others of Jesus because of unbelief. If they believe God would use them, they would go out and tell others if they believed God had done great thing for them, things for them. They couldn't be quiet and they would have obedient faith. Notice that it was his faith that made him obey and choose the name John. And when he did that, his mouth was open to praise the Lord and tell others. And notice that that made others marvel. And even it says, fear the Lord as they saw the change in his life. When we really serve the Lord, our lives will be changed and others might want to be saved also. Verse 67, we find then reasons to praise Jesus, serve Jesus, follow Jesus, believe in Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the Bible. John 20, verse 30 and 31 says, these things are written so you might believe on Jesus as the Son of God. And then Luke 1, 2 and 3, Luke says, I'm writing these things to put in order all the things about Jesus so that you'll believe and want to serve him. That's what the Bible does. It makes us know about Jesus and want to serve Jesus. If we're into the Bible enough, then our lives would be dedicated to serve him. And that's what we find here with the Benedictus of Zechariah. Verse 67 his father, John's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied. 
We can't really talk to others without being filled with the Holy Ghost, but when we're really filled with the Holy Spirit, then we'll want to praise the Lord. To prophesy might be to give a testimony, might be to preach. You can also prophesy by singing. Here we have a prayer, a song, a testimony, all in one. It says, the first word again, blessed, benedictus, it says in the Latin then, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up the horn of salvation, a powerful savior for us in the house of his servant David. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we appreciate and praise God's compassion that he shows to those who trust him as Emmanuel. Notice it says he hath visited his people in verse 68. God with us. When you have belief in him, you think he's with you as Emmanuel. And you want to demonstrate his grace that he is given a powerful savior, as it says here, to redeem us. You show that you don't want to be a slave to sin. Redeem means to be bought back, bought out of sin. So first of all, your mouth is open to praise God for his compassion, for his goodness, for his presence with you, because it says there he has visited us for his redemption and for his salvation, for he's raised up the horn of salvation. The King James says, the Spanish translates that, a powerful savior. And that's what the idea of a horn is the idea of power and strength and authority. And so when it says horn of salvation, the idea is powerful savior, powerful salvation. So we find here that we praise him because he is so compassionate and powerful in his salvation. And we praise him also, second in verse 70, because of his faithfulness. And he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Notice that we praise him for his faithfulness in fulfilling his word and his prophecies, knowing that from the beginning of the world, God knew what he would do. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't lose control. He had planned a savior that would come and step on the foot, on, on, the, on the head of the devil, it says there. And so he would be able to save Adam and Eve, but he knew what he would do. He planned what he would do, and he was going to fulfill his word. And that's the way with us. He knew that we would be sinners. And that's why he sent Jesus to be born of the virgin, to die on the cross and rise again. Because he had a plan how to save us. And then he says, I'm going to give you a promise. We could say a prophecy. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Show your faith by calling on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. For whoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. You shall believe on the Lord Jesus, shall be saved. Confess and believe in your heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead and you shall be saved. If you really believe you're a sinner and you know you've done evil things and can't change yourself, but you want to change, then you can say, God, I can't change myself, but I believe in you that you can save me, you can change me. And so we find here that God always keeps his word as he makes it where he would send a savior and he would make a plan of salvation for all who would believe in him, they would be saved, redeemed, as it says there. Verse 71, another thing that we should praise him for is his power over his enemies. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of them that hate us. God allows us to have enemies of the devil, the demons, sin, the world, lust, pride, materialism, and the last enemy, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, is death. But God had a plan for all of that, and we praise him because he has power over our enemies. And if I feel like the devil is just bothering me so much, I can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. If I feel like I'm trapped in sin, I can say, dear Jesus, free me of this, cleanse me, wash me, change me. 
if the world is tempting me to be pride, proud and have the pride of life and want praise of the world, if I have lusts, the desires of the flesh, if I have a desire of things in this world, and I'm afraid of death, and I say, oh, what if I get this virus and I die? God takes away fear, and God gives power over death so that we can know even if we die, we'll go to heaven. We can have power over materialism, saying it's much better to serve Jesus than it is to have things. We can have power over our lusts and say, Jesus, you can help me to conquer. Help me to love you more than I love my food and more than I love my carnal desires. We can always know that he'll give us victory and make us more than conquerors. Verse 72, it says, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. We don't only praise him because he's compassionate in verse 67, not only praise him because he fulfills his word to save us, provide salvation, and then apply his salvation by faith. We don't only praise him because he has power over all enemies, but we praise him because of his mercy. It's his mercy that motivated him to die for us. He didn't die for me because I was good, but because he was merciful. It says there, he remembered his mercy, the mercy he promised to the fathers. He knows that we'll be faithless. He knows that we'll not be faithful to him. But even though many will not have faith, many will not be faithful, he says, I'm still going to make a pact, a promise, a covenant that I will die for sinners and die for all sin. And then I'll offer that salvation to all who will accept it. If they reject it, okay, I've done my part. I've paid for their sin. And if they don't want to apply it, they'll still have to go to hell, but I don't want that. And so he made a promise and it was because of his mercy that he made it. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. And so I praise him for his goodness. When I'm so bad, he's so good. And I praise him for that mercy. Verse 74 and 75, that the world would grant unto us first being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, that we might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. We praise him because he frees us to serve him. He motivates, mo gives us motivation to serve him. It says without fear. Oh, the devil makes me afraid. Oh, this is going to happen and that'll happen if you give your life to serve Jesus. You won't have friends. You won't have pleasure. But Jesus says, serve me without fear in holiness. Holiness means, of course, apart, separated from sin. God wants me to live a holy life, not living for my pleasures and sin. But holiness also just means separated unto God. It says, I need to give my life to be wholly acceptable unto God, which is his reasonable service, Romans 12. And so I separate my life and say, God, I'm on earth to serve you. And I want to be a full service of you, to you with my whole heart. And I want to do what it says here in righteousness, because I know that you can't accept a dirty vessel, but I ask you to forgive me and I present myself to you with my whole heart. If you'll help me to live for you righteously, separated from sin, then that's what I want to do, Lord. So he grants us then to be free to serve him. We don't even have desire. We can't serve him until he has forgiven us. And then he takes away all fear and he motivates us with that love that he has, with a freedom. I say, thank you for making me free of my sin, free to serve you, God. Oh, I'm not perfect, but now I can have victory, get forgiveness every time I sin, and sin less every day less. And I thank you for that, Lord. And then the final thing is he shows now in verse 76, when Zacharias prays, not only how good God is in being merciful and being compassionate, in being a God who 
keeps his promises, frees from enemies with his powerful salvation. But then he says he also gives us a plan, a purpose for our lives. Now Zacharias turns from just praising God to talking about John the Baptist. Notice the first thing in his life wasn't his son. It was praising God in all those verses. But now he talks to the little baby with words that the Holy Spirit will inspire. So John the Baptist will remember why he was born. And thou, child, verse 76, shall be called the prophet of the highest. And thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. John was to prepare the ways of the Lord to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by their, for the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high had visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Here we have the way to live that's a plain, clear way. To have light, to know how to live, gives knowledge of salvation to the people. It gives them, it says here, uh, peace, the way of peace. Peace, light, salvation, a guiding hand, a purpose in their life because I fulfilled God's purpose in my life. God is saying, John, tell John, Zechariah, that he is made to serve the Lord. He's made to prepare the way of the Lord. Now that means that he's going to tell people, prepare the way of the Lord by repenting of your sin and letting Jesus come into your heart. Don't let sin be a mountain to block you from Jesus. So John the Baptist preached to make the way plain, get rid of the hills of rebellion, get rid of the valleys of doubt, trust the Lord to make your way plain and happy. Give the knowledge of salvation that Jesus would pay for your sin and Jesus would give his Holy Spirit to help you to live a Christian life. Jesus would be the light of the world to know you how, how to please the Lord and tell them that God's mercy is for Gentiles and for Jews, for religious people. Doesn't matter how pagan you are. Doesn't matter how religious you are. God offers righteousness, faith, peace, forgiveness, happiness, joy. You know, we said when Zechariah went into Texas that there were eight believers in his first little church about 50 believers in the whole state. He lived exactly 80 years. He died in December of 1883. He was born in 1803 and died in 1883, almost exactly 80 years old. But when he died, there weren't just eight or 50 believers he had worked throughout all of those years to win many souls for Christ and disciple them, to build a number of churches, even associations of churches. And by the time he died, there were like 80,000 believers. So from eight to 80,000, God had multiplied his efforts. We say, well, I can't do anything. I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God has a purpose in your life like he had for John the Baptist and for each of us, but we have to believe that he can do it, that he will do it, and say, dear Jesus, I want to serve you. I have, de I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Maybe this week you would like to learn a Bible verse, perhaps like verse 77 of Luke 1 or 79. Verse 77, give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Or verse 79, give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Think about that. Give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins. Luke 1, 77. I encourage you, every week this year, try to learn a Bible verse. Perhaps that would be a good one for you to consider. 
And I encourage you to watch the same Bible study in Spanish. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of John the Baptist, for his father, Zachariah, and for Zacharias, who was the missionary who went to, the Baptist missionary who went to Texas. We just pray that thou wilt use us like you used John the Baptist and like you used Zacharias and so many other servants of God. But first, Father, we know that if we're not saved, we need to confess that we're sinners, that we can't change or save ourselves or forgive ourselves. And help us, Father, each one to be sure that we've called on the name of the Lord with faith and with desire to change and be made holy and then trust in the Lord Jesus, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to save us and forgive us. Help us, Father, to honor and glorify you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'll be giving a prayer time at 7 o'clock this Wednesday night live. Tomorrow, Pastor Seth will be giving a devotional it's Thursday evening that everyone can listen to for the new year. So we trust you be with us Sunday. If it's raining, we'll be giving an online devotional at 1030 in the morning. And if it's not raining, we invite you to come to the church at 1030 in the morning. God bless you.